Oh, hey. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Roger, I'm here. I read you five by five. How you doing, Chris? Ooh, I'm doing well. Does everybody like my new camera? You said this is Chris good. has a brand new webcam. Now, you know, we, we're giving people a moment to join us here, but um, Take that in. as people join us, they need to know that Chris has a brand new webcam, and doesn't he look sharp? Looks marvelous, darling. It's like he's amazing. It's uh, it's it's. I feel I was all ready to buy one for myself, and then I looked at the price of it and decided that maybe that could be postponed for a little bit. Um, we're gonna before we get started, we'll wait a few minutes for people to join us. Please say hello and and greet us and tell us where you're uh, watching from and listening from. Um, and we're here talking about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. And all of our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. Chris, tell us, who are some of the people we've got uh, watching today? Oh, well, we have some of, uh, we have Neil, uh, Neil, Neil Shara, Sam Meyer, Nancy Nylans, Doreen Schultz, Ken Hartrup from Kansas. Um, we have Duncan John, from Normandy. Duncan yeah. from Normandy. And John Matthews, who thinks that I look thinner with this new camera. So thank you for that, John. John. <laughs> yeah, John is trying to, get a, John's trying to get a discount on the next tour, Chris. And John will. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And we've got Eric from Tacoma uh, and Eileen from Mobile, Alabama. I hope I said that right. Uh, both Eileen and Mobile. And uh, Brian and Cindy, who have joined us, and, and all sorts of other people. Carolyn Spence Cagle, who uh, says the Missouri Cagles are on, and Carolyn's father was in what World War II unit? Do you imagine that would be, Chris? Um, he was uh, in the Ghost Army. You're, like, jumping the gun here. I know. <laughs> all right, here we go. Early, I know, and we haven't even done the open yet, so I guess it's time that we push the button and get this baby underway. <laughs> And the bar is the bar open. Is open. The bar is open. So our format today is going to be a little bit different than normal. So usually we have a, a guest on to talk about uh, different stuff, and today we're turning the tables a little bit. And I am going to be interviewing Chris about a subject <laughs> near and dear to his heart, Major Dick Winters, uh, commander of Easy Company, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne in World War II. And I think most of you guys know, are well aware, uh, that he became quite famous through, first of all, the book by Stephen Ambrose, Band of Brothers, and then the uh, HBO miniseries of the same name that came out in 2001. And long before either of those, uh, Chris Anderson uh, knew Dick Winters, met him, became friends with him, and had a chance to talk with him in depth about his uh, experiences in World War II. And that is what we're going to talk about today. And we're hoping that we'll be able to get to some of your questions as well. And Chris, I want to start out just by asking um, how this got started, how you connected with the story of Easy Company, how you came to meet uh, Dick Winters, and, and when that happened. Well, I, you know, um, obviously, as we've kind of made clear, um, I'm a bit of a history geek, as you are. Um, when I was very young, I remember seeing a copy of uh, Don Bergette's book. Um, this had various names, but uh, Don Bergette's book on Normandy. Um, and on the front cover were paratroopers descending to earth. And I thought that that was just amazing. So read quite a bit as a youngster. Um, and then uh, purely by happenstance, I had a chance uh, to meet Jack Agnew. And Jack Agnew was in the demolitions platoon of the 506th. Um, otherwise known as the Filthy 13. And uh, at that time, uh, Jack uh, had been doing the newsletter for the 506 with Bill Garnier. Um, and uh, I got to know them. Uh, and then eventually uh, Bill, you know, shared some addresses with me and I wrote to major winners. And, and you know, at first it, these were just other veterans because I was interviewing all sorts of veterans. Um, but then um, as I got older, uh, the letters got longer, uh, and then eventually, um, after college, uh, I got to meet with Winters. I was living down in the area, and um, 
so we we had a chance to begin talking. So this was, um, I, I had first started corresponding with Winters just as Ambrose was kind of working on the book a bit. So uh, just before the book, and then um, obviously a lot more involved before the series came out. I've lost you, Rick. It would help if I unmuted, <laughs> right? And and I did get a request that says, "Chris, louder, okay. please." So I'll I don't do know my best. if you can. If you can, uh, if you can, uh, I'll do my best. Is that better? You know, move that microphone closer. There it's a principle go. of physics, as my mother used to say. Um, so, and when when was this? This is in the 1980s. You said just yeah, around so, the time you're getting out of college. Yeah, so late 80s, early 90s with Winters that I, that I started finally um, uh, first corresponding. You know, with some regularity and, and int uh, intensity, um, and then uh, after the book came out. Uh, I was a historian for the National Guard in Washington, D.C., which, of course, is close to Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, and so then I finally had a chance to go up and meet with him in person. And, and that's sort of how it got going. So there you are. You're a geeky young historian, newly minted historian. <laughs> and um, how did you approach that And uh, with him? How did you get him to talk about stuff? And to had he already done a lot of this with people or had he not really spoken to a lot of people outside of easy company about his experiences well I would say that at that point um, he hadn't talked to a lot of people I mean there had been obviously you know he talked to Ambrose some but um, he was just another veteran and you know before the book came out there were lots of veterans of World War two and, and he was involved with the men but I don't think that people were knocking on his door and beating on the door um, and when I finally got the chance to interview him, um, I because you know he wasn't internationally famous at that point, um, I approached it as I approached interviews with any veteran, which is um, I always started by asking him about uh, their funniest day in the service, um, because I thought every veteran's got a funny story, and uh, that okay. What was his funny what story? What was his funniest day in the service? Uh, well, I tell this on the tour quite a bit, but um, he tells a wonderful story about um, about being at Tacoa and being uh, in training there. Uh, and he's a young lieutenant. He's at Tacoa, and he gets the call. He says, uh, Lieutenant Winters, you have to get into town. One of your men's in trouble. He's in the, he's in the uh, sheriff's office. So Winters dri drives down there and... Um, one of his young charges had been caught on the railroad tracks with a young lady from Tacoa, uh, kind of halfway through the process of what young men and young women do, um, and when he was arrested. And uh, so Winters asked this young soldier, so could you, would you care to explain yourself, son? And he says, well, sir, uh, she was coming, the train was coming, and I was coming, and I thought it was important that I finish my mission. <laughs> Okay, you heard about it on History Happy <laughs> Hour, people. <laughs> and the great, the great thing about I'm never going to get that story out of my head. I know, but the great thing about it is when Winters told me, he said, um, "You know, Chris, everybody thinks that I have no sense of humor. I have a terrific sense of humor. I'll show you." <laughs> and then he told me the story, uh, and he got this wonderful little smile with just a little. You know, his lips just turned up just a little bit on the ends, and that was that was his funny story. You know, it's funny. I, I never expected to be talking about my mother-in-law on this show in comparison <laughs> to Dick Winters, but she also was a person with a wonderful sense of humor who nobody thought had a sense of humor, but she just wanted to see how you took it, and right. she would wait for you to, to, to see if you were smart enough to understand that she was being funny, essentially. But, yep. Uh, I, I love that 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 uh, kind of sneaking up on your sense of humor. Um, you know, I, you must have covered a lot of ground, and we're never going to get through all of it. Um, I think one of the things that I was interested in is what was he interested in talking about? I mean, I've interviewed a lot of veterans as well, and um, and many of them kind of have a certain set of stories that they tell. But I mean, with everybody, there's there's the things that you want to find out, and there's the things that they really want to tell you that they think are important. And oftentimes, I've found it's really about what they think is important. It's, it ends up being the heart of the interview rather than what I walked in thinking was important. Right. So what did he want to talk about? What was the stuff that he really wanted to come back to and expound on? Well, you know, it's... It I was thinking about that a lot um, this week because I had actually written a blog post about 
about how the tour came about, um, which dovetails nicely with this. But one of the things that, that he always would talk about whenever we spoke um, was leadership. You know, he said that um, if people are just interested in the war because they want to know what happened or kind of morbid curiosity, there's no point in that. There's no reason for me to talk. Um, but if I can impart some of the things I learned so that should this happen again, should young men find themselves in this position again, uh, they can take something, they can learn something from what I experienced. Um, so his, his kind of reason that whenever he spoke about this um, was all about leadership. And, you know, and that actually goes back, you know, all the way to the war. They're being evacuated from Normandy. So, you know, July 44, they've just sur endured the Normandy campaign, his first time in combat. Um, and his friend Lewis Nixon comes up to him and says, you know, um, Dick, we're going to be getting a lot of replacements in when we get back to England. Um, and what we'd really like is for you to talk to some of these young officers about leadership, what it takes to lead men in combat. And so, you know, from a very early point in the whole process, um, that became what was so important to him. Do you think, I mean, so one of the things that um, when I was thinking about talking to you about this, I mean, people have seen, um, many people maybe watching have seen Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. And so they've seen the kind of dramatization of some of the um, uh, big moments in the war for, for Lieutenant Winters uh, and later Captain and Major Winters. The 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 attack on Braycor Manor, the um, the, uh, uh, the the uh, what they called the attack at the island uh, in the October forty four in Holland, uh, the the uh, attack on Foy, just to, to, to pick three. Also, when he led uh, folks into Carantan, um, and in each of these cases, there's a um, very personal involvement from him as an officer. You know, he's he's in danger. He is leading. He has to make decisions, and he manages to get it right in these uh, in the, all these cases, which is of course why he's alive and why a lot of his men survived as well. And and I was going to say what what runs through there. I mean, leadership obviously is part of that, but what made him successful, able to be successful there in, this, in these terrible circumstances. I mean, heart pounding, absolutely awful, um, unimaginable circumstances. What do you think, you know, what did, what did you get from that? Well, I mean, you know, and we'll, we may get in more into this later, but the first thing and the most important thing about uh, Winters is um, his constant state of preparation. Um, this is a man who is perpetually um, studying and preparing um, and getting ready for this moment. Um, you know, I, when he's in Allborn, when all the other officers are off on leave or at the pub or doing whatever it is they're doing, Winters is back in his room studying a manual. Uh, when the 101st Division uh, goes up to Bastogne at the start of uh, the Ardennes Offensive, Winters actually brings uh, the manual on infantry assaults and he puts it in his musette bag and the night before the attack on Foy he's reading the manual um, but that part aside when he's in these situations uh, what Winters does um, and I don't and I should add I don't think the series shows this very well um, Winters separates himself out uh, from the action before it happens he said whenever I was faced with a situation where I had to, to make a difficult decision or a complex decision, I would remove myself mentally from what was happening around me. I'd separate myself out. I would think things through, even if only for a few quick moments. Um, I would try as best as I could to conduct uh, a personal reconnaissance of where the action was going to take place so that I had a clear idea in my mind about what I needed to accomplish and what would be required so that when I went back to my men, it was, boom, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. Um, and because of some other things that we can get into later, they had enough faith in him that they just followed. So it, there's, a, there's a thoughtfulness involved Absolutely. in that and a, and a preparation. You know, it's not just the character, you know, that comes out in the moment. It's all about the training and the preparation and building to that moment and how he personally did that. Right, and, and it, it, it really is about training. I mean, Winters would say that there's... Now, 
I should preface this by saying that we could disagree with him a little bit on this, but he said that there are no natural leaders. Leadership is taught and it's learned and it's learned through hard work, study and effort. Um, and it's those preparations prior to the moment when leadership is required um, that makes you an effective leader. If you can prepare for what's coming, you will feel comfortable in yourself and then you'll feel comfortable you know, dictating orders as required. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that the, the series really missed an opportunity on was to convey that part of him, that, that studious, um, dedicated part, and also how he would, you know, separate himself out before uh, taking an action. Um, so, as you mentioned earlier, uh, and, and I just want to remind folks that we're talking to Chris Anderson about uh, uh, Dick Winters, who he got to know very, very well. Um, uh, many years ago and, and talk with uh, extensively. And if you have questions you want to ask, please just post them up in the comments and we'll get to the ones we can. Um, you have this guy, he goes off to war and he comes home and he is, as we talked about the other day, he's one of many thousands of people who command companies uh, that fight in, uh, in World War II in, the, in Europe. Um, and he's not famous, he's not uh, well known, uh, and then 40 plus years later he suddenly becomes maybe the, <laughs> the, the best famous. known uh, uh, soldier officer of World War II. I mean you could make the argument that after Patton and Eisenhower, uh, Dick Winters is probably the name that, that people know. And he's sort of elevated into, I don't want to say mythic status, but it's kind of a <clears throat> a sort of a, a bigger than life. Um, he's lionized quite a bit. And I wonder, you know, he was, he, he, and then of course there have been many other books and documentaries after Band of Brothers. He, what did he make of all this? Um, you know, this sort of the hoopla around what he did and, and, and sort of what, what do you make of it when you're sort of analyzing what he did versus, I mean, not necessarily versus other company commanders, but in the context of the greater war well you know I, I think that um, as you would be naturally he was he was humbled by the attention um, but I, th I I think that he was a bit bothered by it because he was a very modest person um, and that that goes back to his training and preparation for the war I mean after um, his attack on the uh, and the Germans on the island in Holland in October of 44, which he considers his finest moment of leadership. Um, he said that when I wrote the after action report to describe this action that leads to, you know, his promotion to uh, commanding the battalion, I never used, uh, I never used the word I in describing what had happened. Um, it was always we. And he would always stress that this isn't about me as a person. So I think that um, he was bothered by um, too much focus on him as a person. Now, using him as an example to talk about what other people had done or using him as a, an illustration of all junior officers, he thought it was important. And I think that's what kept him talking. Um, but he would be the first person to say, I'm just an officer. I, you know, I, I graduated from OCS, um, and and Winters was a remarkable officer. Um, he he was, uh, but he was the product of a system that was put in place at the start of the war uh, by people like General Marshall. You know, there are a hundred thousand young men who go through officer candidate school during the war. Of that amount, sixty-seven percent graduate and are commissioned as second lieutenants. So let's be very, very conservative and say of those 67,000 young men, 10% make good officers. Well, that's 65, 60, you know, 6,700 men who were effective at their jobs. And, and Winters would say that I was a product of a system and I succeeded through um, hard study and work. It, it didn't come naturally to him. Well, we've got a related question on that from John Matthew, who, who asks, um, um, uh, what did Dick Winters think of the TV series, and what does Chris think about it? 
And uh, so you can you can give us your point of view. We don't take up the rest of the hour, Chris. That's, that's all <laughs> no, I no. ask. No, I, I think uh, Winters <clears throat> was very impressed by the series. I think overall he was very happy with it. Um, he would certainly call out things that he, not that were wrong, but that were different than what had happened. Um, so he talked about some things in the, in the uh, operation on the dike that he was, he said was you know artistic license. There was some artistic license taken um, during the, the last patrol episode. Um, but as a way of conveying the idea of leadership and what soldiers in World War II accomplished, um, he was very uh, supportive of the series. I should also mention that he was also deeply involved in the series. So uh, Winters is all <coughs> about study and preparation. So when they, were, when they were making the series, when there were things that he said, that that's just too far, he would call him out on it. Um, and I know at one point uh, they were filming a, an episode in which uh, Winters cursed. Uh, he yeah. swore a blue streak. Uh, and Winters uh, called up HBO and said, nope, didn't happen, got to change it. And HBO said, well, you know, I'm sorry, Major Winters, but we've already filmed it, we've edited it, and it's getting ready to go, so, you know, you're just going to have to live with it. And Winters was like, oh, no, 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 no. You either change it or my participation and the participation of every member of the company is off. And so they changed it. Um, so th I think part of the reason he was happy with the series was because he made sure that he was happy with the series. Um, for me... Um, I think it's a wonderful series. I think it does a great job of conveying the story of um, a company in combat during World War II. Do I think it's 100% accurate or authentic? No. Um, are there things that little things that I quibble with? Absolutely. Uh, but as a way to, again, talk about a company of soldiers in combat, I think it does a very good job. Um, and of course, the, the biggest thing it does is it made millions and millions and millions of people aware of what these men had done, and right? So of that, not just those men, there. but 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 of all the soldiers, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it raises and it get kind of. I mean, I think I think people who've watched it multiple times, you, you you feel like you you understand maybe what they're going through in a way that um, you know other books or other movies really really hadn't given you, and and put you put you kind of put you right there. And I mean, I would say, and 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 we've talked about having another show sometime where we we sort of do best and worst historical movies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, all films uh, lie to a certain degree; they have sure. to. Um, it's it's inherent in the form, even documentaries. Um, even your documentary. Even even documentaries that I've done, all <laughs> films uh, have to leave the, they simply by picking certain things. Absolutely. to talk about and other Absolutely. things not to simply by where you put the camera you are now leaving part of the story out uh, and telling the story in a different way um, but but I was you know in the reading that I've done I think what struck me about that miniseries is that is how much of it is really tied or trying to be tied to the truth and to the experiences sure. and I know that every soldier in there is going to say well it didn't do this or it did do this right. and there's going to be stuff but um, um, I think it still remains a pretty impressive thing 20 years later. Absolutely. We have a couple of questions that are um, along the same line, so I'll pick one here uh, from David. Uh, was Winters a spiritual person, or did he s ascribe his survival to blind fate? And someone else asked a very similar question as to, you know, was he, uh, was he, uh, was his faith, important to his success as a leader? That's interesting. Um, I had asked him that, and it was one of those moments, um, because, you know, I, I would go up there a couple times a month, and I'd sit with him, and we would talk about different things. Um, and I was curious about that. Um, and I remember vividly, because um, I said, you know, was faith important to you, and how religious were you coming from the background that you came from? Uh, and he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, Chris, I am not a religious person. However, Chris, I am a spiritual person. And what I mean by that is faith is something that is very personal to an individual. So it is very important to me. My faith is a very personal thing, but I'm not religious. However, saying that, um, 
he took great comfort in going to church, particularly when he was in England, uh, staying with the Barnes family in Alborn. He would go always go to Mr. Barnes's uh, services, um, and he would always, uh, if opportunity presented itself, uh, uh, go to religious services. Uh, but that was a very personal thing to him. You know, there was never any public pronouncements of faith or anything. That was something just for himself. So um, there's a, a this is a comment more than a question, and it's uh, it comes from Stephen Ambrose historical tours, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make the wild guess that this is Edie Ambrose uh, <laughs> making this comment, who is of course Stephen Ambrose's niece, and unless of course it's her husband Yakir who said that Ambrose told me that Easy Company and Winters are just an example of a U.S. Army unit, although a great example, and that, and that it, the story was made easier to tell because he kept great records, notes, and maps, etc. Uh, did you find that when you were talking to him? Did he have a lot of uh, material that he was able to refer to that way? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, people in other companies and other people I've met over the years have said, well, why did they pick Easy Company and why is Easy Company so special? Well, one of the reasons is, is that Winters prepared uh, himself and his company for that. I mean, um, unlike a lot of companies and a lot of veterans, um, at the end of the war, Winters stayed uh, involved. He always kept tabs on the men. He always, he saved every letter um, in and out. He made notes about every phone conversation, and he re he saved all these things, uh, so that um, it was a form of preparation for him, um, and so that when when Ambrose came along with an interest in writing a book about a company in combat in Europe, boom! Here is a guy who is prepared and ready, and you know, Rick, uh, you know, you're a writer. If somebody came up to you and said, "I have a filing cabinet full of all the primary sources you will need to write your book." You would probably say, I'm going to write your history. Right, especially if that's interesting. I think that's always, um, you know, a, a lot of writers that I've talked to, um, and you and I have talked to a lot in the last uh, 25 weeks, uh, will say, you know, I, I look at a story, you know, I'm interested in a topic, and then I, I like check around to see if there's going to be any material there. Is there some kind of diary or some kind of records right. or something that I can that I can delve into? Because, of course... Um, um, the stories change, right? The oral history stories. Um, and I wonder, you know, over time, the, 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 the fish gets bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And sure. I wondered, uh, um, as someone who talked to, to Dick Winters on the early side of the curve, did you, uh, was there something that as time went by and you heard him tell stories to other people or other people write about what he'd told them or other people write about what they'd heard somebody say that he said, were there stories that you saw that really changed over time? And, and of course, that's why the records are so important because they give you something to ground yourself in. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I will say that, that Winters um, was always very consistent in his stories. Um, uh, the truth of a story, because he used a story to illustrate a point. Um, again, the point of a lot of his stories was about leadership. So his stories didn't really change. Um, however, what has changed is how people tell the story of Winters. Um, and this, you know, we talked about this a little bit already, but um, he has become this, this mythical, larger than life figure who, you know, descended on Easy Company and kind of effortlessly led them through victory in Europe and almost single-handedly, um, which is just not true. Um, I, I, find, I saw something on the internet the other day that called him the warrior monk of World War II that. and how he'd religiously prepared himself for this moment. And that's just absolute bullshit. Um, and so I think that um, there are other people that ascribe certain qualities to him um, that aren't true, uh, and the and the fact of the matter is is that um, Winters became an effective leader uh, through hard work, study, dedication to his craft, um, and caring about his men. And it wasn't magical, and it wasn't mystical, and he wasn't braver than you know however many good officers OCS produced or or what have you. Um, but but he always um, stayed very close to the truth. And which is one way, you know, if a person's stories remain consistent, it's one way you know that they are likely, you know, 
the real Absolutely. the real deal. Um, Absolutely. And when they when they also match up with the paperwork that you can find and the the stuff that you can find and and it's, you know oddly it's the, always the people who keep the most material, I think who have the most um, uh, consistent stories because they have been referring to their own you know mm -hmm. records right they've they've they if they probably haven't just shoved them in a drawer they've looked at them and it's Absolutely. reminded them and grounded them in their stories. We have several people who asked. Um, uh, first of all, I do want to credit your friend uh, Barry, who asked this a couple of days ago, asked us to put it in, and a few other people uh, have asked us about um, Dick Winter's friendship with Lewis Nixon, sure. and uh, who, of course, was another uh, officer uh, in uh, the 506th, who came from a very different background, mm -hmm. who was uh, a, a bit of a drinker, uh, a, bit, yeah. a bit compared like you Rick like you um, yes uh, <laughs> okay I didn't realize I had that much of a problem but um, uh, I'll, I'll go seek medical assistance as soon as possible um, and just a very different person and people are kind of like well how did they get to be friends and w w what what's that all about now I don't know if you talked to him about that because of course you sure. might not have been thinking a lot about Lewis Nixon uh, when you're interviewing oh. him but what came out there well, I, you know, I think I think, um, and I think about that a lot because I get this question quite a bit. Uh, one of the things was um, Nixon uh, was absolutely honest in who he was, um, and he had, in part because of his background, um, he had no um, ambition as far as I have to be the best officer, or I have to prove myself, or. He was very comfortable in his own skin. Uh, and I think because Winters um, felt comfortable in his own skin, there was there was that sense of, you know, we're just here to do a job and we're going to do it well. And, you know, I don't care about who gets the credit or, you know, whatnot. So I think that was part of it. Um, the other thing was that Nixon, the, sorry, that Winters told me that, you know, for all of Nixon's, you might want to call them problems or personality quirks or whatever um, he was absolutely dedicated to the mission so um, he was very serious about what they had to do and what was at stake um, and that was important to Winters um, so the fact that he felt comfortable with Winters he wasn't a rival um, he hadn't didn't have anything to prove so he they had that um, I think that Winters um, was a very studious person um, not self-educated, but in a way, he was always trying to improve himself. And what and Nixon was a smart guy, and they could have intellectual conversations about things. And I think that Winters found that comforting. You know, uh, Jack Sadler made a, a comment here. He says, "I told Winters he was my hero, and he said I am no hero. Spears, Lieutenant Spears, mm -hmm. is a hero." And and. That's gonna. I'm gonna jump from that to a question to you, Chris. Um, I imagine, when I think of your conversations with Dick Winters, that he probably talked a lot about other people. Like yeah. you said, he didn't put me in that report. He didn't put I. He talked about other people. Mm -hmm. So, what people, what type of behavior impressed Dick Winters? Uh, what impressed Dick Winters? Um, people that understood the responsibility of um, leading men into combat. So Winters was very impre impressed by McAuliffe. Uh, he was tremendously impressed by Eisenhower uh, and making that decision to, to launch, uh, the, to, to have the paratroopers jump during the invasion. Um, he admired people who uh, just wouldn't give up no matter what. So I think of um, a young woman I know, or she was a young woman, uh, uh, Barbara Sowerby, who um, was a young girl who was captured by the Japanese as a young girl uh, and survived the Japanese prison camps. Uh, and they got to know each other because Barbara made it back and um, lived in Auburn. And some of you may have met her. She's um, She and her husband and son, they have the last Nissen hut that Easy Company um, stayed with when they were in Auburn. But he was very impressed by that because she just would not, she just refused to give up. Um, and, and he was also um, in awe of the men of Easy Company and what they would endure. 
Um, but but the things that would impress him the most, I would say, would be people that took their position seriously, that worked continuously to improve themselves and be ready for whatever was to come, and people who just would not give up. And, you know, uh, uh, Ted Moon asks a question here. Um, it's, I flicked on the wrong one. Sorry there. Um, uh, uh, about Lieutenant Compton uh, and said that, you know, watching the miniseries, it appeared that Winters did not agree with his style. And I don't know if that's the TV series or reality. Uh, you know, what can you share about that? So that Lieutenant Buck Compton, who later went on to become, a, I think, a Supreme Court judge in California or had some uh, yeah, tremendous yeah. post-war career. Well, I mean, and this... this um Again, I think is something that's kind of been lost in the evolving view of Winters. Um, Winters admired uh, Buck Compton as a combat leader immensely. He thought he was a fantastic officer. Um, but uh, his one criticism of, of Compton was that he perhaps got a little bit too close to the men, um, that he didn't understand um, that there was a point at which you couldn't be their friends. Um, and another one of those moments that I remember vividly uh, was talking to Winters about uh, the company, about the men of the company. And, and as he always did, um, you know, he talked about how fantastic they were and how wonderful they were and how important they were to him. Um, but he did uh, then look me dead in the eye and he said, Chris, despite how I felt about these men, if I had a mission to accomplish, I would have sacrificed them to accomplish the mission. Um, which, you know, caused me to rock back and sure. try to process that. But um, I think that uh, that he maybe thought that Compton didn't understand sometimes that there was a separation. At some point, you have to command these men to do things that you might not want to do. That it was hard for Compton to do that. Um, and, and it was obviously, it was certainly very, very hard for Winters, and we can get into, into this more. Um, it certainly weighed on him, uh, but he said, I had a mission, and if I needed to do something to accomplish my mission, I would do that. Well, you said earlier, um, I think when we were talking before we went on the air, that, uh, that and I, I assume this is what you're referring to, that, that the, the sort of the duties of leadership weighed heavily on him. That the fact that he was um, commanding men in battle, um, life or death, weighed heavily on him then and continued to weigh heavily, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, he, he lived with that war every day for the rest of his life. And I don't, I don't say that lightly. And again, I think that's something that may have been lost in the years or because of all the hype. You know, these people went on with their lives and they carried those memories with them and um, it, it never did leave him. You know, he said um, continuously during the war and then after the war, he said, you know, I've only been gone for two years, uh, but that age, that experience aged me by decades. Um, he had a young woman uh, named Dieta that he was writing to and uh, she had said at one point, um, that I've noticed that you're starting to get wrinkles, or those worry wrinkles. And he, he later felt bad about this, He's, but he said, I wrote back very sarcastically and said, yes, they're worry wrinkles. They're worried because I have 600 men who I'm, I'm worried about. Um, and, and that bore on him. And I, I asked Rick, I asked you to show these pictures, because um, I don't think people do this enough, but if you take these three photographs of Winters, there's one of him just after his commissioning, uh, on the upper left hand um, and then to the right is that famous photograph of him taken at Chandrelocht and then at the bottom there at the end of the war. Um, he's a young man there but you can see just in the course of those photographs how much the war has aged him. Uh, and I'd encourage you if you, you know, if the pictures are small here, if you get a chance, you can find these photographs on the internet. Print them out and hold them up very close to one another and you can see just physically how that war changed him. Yeah, he looks like a 40-year-old, um, a 50-year-old in that bottom picture. Absolutely. Uh, it looks completely different than, completely the, different than the other person. pictures. Chris, I want to uh, uh, kind of change things up a little bit here. Sure. Uh, and um, uh, George Luz, who, uh, whose father 
George Luz, uh, served in Easy Company uh, under Dick Winters. George, George, uh, I don't know if it's Junior, but I'll say George Junior to George distinguish, Junior. <laughs> uh, is a frequent uh, viewer of this show. And he sent some uh, audio along to us uh, uh, from around 1992 from a book signing that Winters did when he was talking. And um, he thought it would be interesting for us to take a listen to Dick Winters, and I think it would be, so I'm going to play uh, this little audio clip, which has to do with um, uh, flying in to Normandy uh, there on the night of June 5th uh, to parachute into Normandy and his description of that experience. It's, it's really quite something, so let's listen. We were on course for Normandy at 23.42 and the altitude was dropped now to 1,500 feet. After we got on, hit the channel, we dropped to 500 feet. The reason being, they did not want the Germans to pick us up on radar. In our plane, we received a green light to jump. Uh, normally, the plane will reduce the speed to 95 to 100 miles an hour. However, on this one, when this plane started to have the hit, he turned the motors on all the way and started to dive. As I went out the door, I judged to myself, this must be 150 miles an hour. The result was, when the chute opened, the shock was so great, it tore everything off. The leg bag went off. Anything in my pockets went out. Uh, coming down, I was trying to keep my eye on my leg bag so I could get my equipment. Uh, I also had a machine gun trying to pick me up. So I slipped to avoid the machine gun fire and tried to slip towards the leg bag. Uh, jumping at low altitude was down very quickly, landed in some trees, and uh, got out of my chute as quickly as possible. Uh, as I said, the only thing I had at that point was my knife. We found out later the Germans had picked this large body of planes over England before we ever took off. <coughs> and they were spreading their, the word to their headquarters, large movement of airplanes over England suspect paratroopers are on the way the invasion is Chris your thoughts on on hearing this um, well uh, the first thing is that just to hear his voice again brings back an awful lot of memories um, you know when we do our band of brothers tours uh, George plays these tapes that he has uh, gotten over the years and it always is very poignant for me so just to hear his voice um, the other thing is is to just try to think about him at that moment you know he's he's what 26 years old he's about to go into combat for the first time um, I, I just you think a lot about him that's all yeah you know, um, many years ago, 35, 40 years ago, um, I was with some friends and we were driving around Evanston, Illinois, and we came upon a college reunion on the Northwestern campus and we, we crashed the reunion, you know, as young people can do mm -hmm. in sort of their exuberance. And there were guys there and and they were world war ii veterans and this guy who i'm sitting there chatting with in the tent at the reunion because they were very welcoming of us oh yeah he was uh he had he had been 21 or 22 and he had commanded a bomber with 11 guys on it um or whatever the number and i i think that uh, you know they'd done 20 missions or whatever and i remember I was probably 26 at the time, 25, 26, and I couldn't even imagine being in that situation. And he had done this as somebody much younger than me. I mean, he's somebody who's now, at that time he was 10 years old, younger, 10 years younger than my children are now. Yeah. And uh, it, it is it is sort of almost unimaginable to be, you know, Chantal uses the word insane. It's almost insane to be in that situation. Well, you know, it, it's, um, the thing that's, yeah, um, Winters would tell me that, you know, he wasn't, he, 
Well, he said two things, somewhat contradictory. He said... People will do that. (laughs) He said he lived in fear. He said he lived in fear uh, for his own life. uh, But more importantly, he lived in fear for um, the job he would do for his men. But in terms of Normandy, um, he also said he didn't, he wasn't worried in himself. He felt that he'd done everything he could. He felt that he was as prepared as he could be personally. Uh, But the fear that was with him was whether he'd be able to lead. Um, and, and hearing that speech again, you know, reminded me of um, what he would say when I would ask him about being an all born and leading up to the invasion and getting ready for his jump into combat for the first time. Um, he told me that he felt the responsibility of leading these men into combat um, so strongly that it was a physical presence. He said he could feel the weight of responsibility like you would feel a head cold or a cough. It was always there. Um, so I think that that's why, you know, he says in his account um, that, uh, you know, he saw the invasion fleet as they're flying over and, and um, you know, I, I, I took up a prayer and I, it, the prayer just never really stopped. I just kept thinking about what I was about to do. And I, so hearing him talk about that flight over, you know, I, I'm reminded of him saying that, that, you know, just the thought of the responsibility that he had that was that's what weighed on him um so we're talking again about uh, lieutenant dick winters of uh of band of brothers um and uh uh it's obviously real emotional for you chris because you were uh, uh really good friends with him and we really appreciate your kind of talking through some of this with us and um I have a question, and we have some other questions from people that we're going to try to get to, but um, you and I have both spent significant time, invested significant time, focusing on World War II through the lens of a single unit. In your case, Easy Company. In my case, the Ghost Ghost Army. And, of course, the, the great advantage of that is that you can go into a lot of detail. You can really bring out the experience of individuals. You can understand uh, things close up and then illuminate the larger story through that. But the danger is that you end up overemphasizing maybe the contributions of one unit, although that doesn't apply to the Ghost Army, clearly the most important part of the World War II story. Um, uh, And perhaps drawing attention away from other folks who deserve attention. And I think of, you know, we had uh, some weeks back, we had Joe Balkowski on here talking about the 29th Division. And I think aside from the Bedford boys, most people don't know anything about the 29th Division. And this was a a tremendous battle record, tremendous casualties, many, I'm sure, amazing leaders in it. and but hardly anybody knows about the 29th they know about the airborne they know right. about the rangers they know about you know maybe they know about the ghost army they know about some of those special units it's not really a question so much as a kind of an observation that invites your rumination on it well um yeah let me be absolutely clear before this makes any kind of social media storm that um Oh, oh, do, do go ahead. Here, we'll, we'll um, the, it's going for the close-up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I care deeply about uh, the men of Easy Company and the 506. I was blessed to be made an honorary member of the company um, and a member of the regiment. Uh, they're very important to me. Um, but I think that at times, largely because of the miniseries, um, people spend a little bit too much time focusing on the trees and not the forest. Um, And I think that if you use Easy Company as a vehicle to understand um, a bigger picture, that's great. Um, But I think we should start also to look at all the other units and all the other contributions. Um, The other thing I would like Americans in particular to think about and to read about is, is weaving in the stories of the Pacific and what's happening in Europe and in Italy uh, and to, to maybe get your heads around the notion that we're fighting this global war involving 16 million men and women. Um, so, uh, and I also should add that, um, again, we, we just take this for granted now, but 
one of the things that's so remarkable about Band of Brothers is it changed our notion of how we do history. Before Ambrose wrote that book, there is no such thing as a detailed unit study like the Band of Brothers. And now that's just commonplace. I mean, Rick, you wrote the Ghost Army. That's, that's that model that Ambrose set up by using that one little unit. So, and I think that's a valuable tool. I think that certainly helps us understand the war. It helps people come to grips with it. Um, but I think also you should look at um, the bigger picture as well. Yeah, no, I know. I agree. And I, and, I, and I always try to keep that in mind um, in both in the storytelling in the book and film and both in the, in the tour as well. And we always try to put the ghost army in the context of, of, of what it does with the, with the rest of the, the war. And I mean, it, because the ghost army is great, but it's not going to work by itself. I got to tell you, right. <laughs> the inflatable tanks are not going oh, to win the war. They're going to strike terror into the hearts of the Germans. I know it's going to, it's not going to work. Um, but I, I will say that, um, that the that the miniseries the miniseries came out in 2001 and uh, I started working on that documentary in 2005 and it was very influential in Absolutely. you know wanting to to talk to as many of the soldiers as possible and you know there was a um, I don't want to get us too far off topic but there was a sense that in stories like this you would hear about the story but you wouldn't hear about the people who who did it. And when you hear about the D-Day deception, Operation Fortitude, you will hear about the radio operators and the, and, the, and the Garbo and the spies turned by the Germans, but you will rarely hear about all the people who worked behind the scenes to kind of bring that to life. And sure. so that kind of, of detail telling is, is really, I think, really, really important. Um, we have just a few minutes left here and, and so many questions that we're not going to get to, but I want to bring in one from uh, uh, Cassidy, uh, commendatory, and I always feel a great victory when I can say her name without <laughs> hesitating or stuttering. Um, and Cassidy's been along on some of these uh, trips to Europe uh, uh, well, and people will know her. Um, how do you think we can best carry on his legacy and memory as time goes by? Well, I will tell a Dick Winter's story to answer that question. Um, I had, um, I would get a lot of requests from people uh, back in the day who would want to want me to put them in touch with Major Winters or to talk to Major Winters. Um, and it just got to be too much for him. Um, you know, he was deluged with phone calls and letters um, you know, you would be able to send mail to Hershey, Pennsylvania addressed Dick Winters and it would get delivered because there was a special delivery just for fan mail. Um, and I remember visiting with him, one of my last visits with him, uh, and I, I asked him about, you know, somebody wanted to speak with him and he said, Chris, I can't. Um, and I said, well, you know, much like the question that Cassidy asked, people admire you and they want to know what you think. and what they should do to be better. And he said, Chris, the way to remember me and the men of Easy Company is to vote, pay your taxes, and be a contributing citizen. And if you do that, you'll remember me. So I would say that to Cassidy that that's how you can remember the men of Easy Company and major winners, participate and be involved to do the things that they Fought sacrificed yep. um, their lives in some cases yep. or or their years you know the sacrifice of three or four or five years is no small thing um, and putting yourself in danger to uh, allow us to do those things and um, much as I now regret not making that the last question of the interview <laughs> sorry <laughs> Um, uh, I want, <laughs> um, you know, thank you for that. But I wanted to ask you, you know, so a lot of people have um, glommed on to yep. the Dick Winter story. And, yep. and that does not mean any disrespect. It's a great story and mm. people should write about it. They should retell the story and, and you know, uh, they should be retelling his story and many of these other stories a hundred years from now. 
but what would you, is there anything that you would want to um, set the record straight on that somebody has said, and you've, you've kind of addressed this, so maybe you feel you've already gotten there, but anything that you, somebody has said or, or, or an impression that's been created in the TV series or in the book that you, as somebody who, who knew Dick Winters, wants to say, you know, it's not really that way. I just want to correct the record here. Well, I mean, I, I think I, I have alluded to this a bit, but I would just say, again, that um, the thing to remember about winters and leadership is leadership is hard work. It is the byproduct of serious study uh, and, and effort. It doesn't happen magically. Um, as far as what people may say about him in the future, you know, he's a historical figure now, so people are going to interpret his story in various ways um, I would simply say that Winters um, said what he wanted to say uh, in Stephen Ambrose's book and then later in his own um, biography uh, so anything you know I, I don't think that there's anything new in his writings uh, that it's going to come up but, but he said what he wanted to say and if you want to know what he thinks is important what he wants you to remember you know read his memoir read band of brothers um, and that's I think how you get closest to the person well uh, this has been a terrific conversation Chris and uh, appreciate your being willing to um, to come on the show <laughs> <laughs> oh wait a minute you've come on the show every week for for so many weeks but but to talk about something that is so I know important to you and uh, and emotional for you and and maybe not always even though you talk about it on tours and stuff not always easy to kind of just put yourself out there about and and I'm sure everybody really appreciates it and I'm already seeing their their comments here. Um, 25 weeks. Uh, thanks for keeping this going. I mean, but uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, no, no, just, nobody's saying 25 weeks, please stop. So that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, um, as we talked about before the show, I just wanted to, you know, it was, it's always hard for me um, to talk about somebody who was so important to me, but I wanted to thank you, Rick, and all the people who watch and listen um, to give me an opportunity to talk to somebody, talk about somebody who was um, such a huge part of my life and so important to me. Uh, and someone I think about every day. So thanks. Well, I do understand that, and I really appreciate your being willing to talk. And I want to just let people know who are there that next week we're going to be talking to uh, historian and author David Hoschild, who wrote uh, the book, has written many wonderful books, but uh, Spain in Our Hearts uh, about the Spanish Civil War is one thing that we'll be talking to him about, as well as his uh, kind of general oeuvre of books. And two weeks from now, uh, an, uh, we have somebody talking about another fairly well-known soldier from World War II. Susan Eisenhower is going to be here talking about her grandfather, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Oh, him. Let me check yeah. my notes. Dwight D. Eisenhower. That guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, another well-known World War II officer. And, and her book, her recent book, How Ike Led, which I think, honestly, I think is going to have a lot in common with your comments about yeah, well, how Dick Winters led. Well, we'll have to try to, to weave, those, weave those two together. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. And sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but we got to as many as we could. And uh, we appreciate your being here. Chris, give you the last word. Well, I would just say that uh, if we didn't answer your question, uh, there are ways to reach us through our website, whatnot, shoot me a question. I'm always happy to answer the questions and, and talk about uh, major winners in Easy Company. So thanks. Yeah, so do email us. and yep. Stay safe, everybody. Thank <music> you.